Welcome into Payoff Pitch, Action Network's Major League Baseball betting podcast. Brendan Glasheen joined by Tanner McGrath to break down today's loaded playoff slate. Four games, all four series in action today. Starts this afternoon with Guardians and Tigers. That series tied 1-1. Mets have a 2-1 series lead on the Phillies over in the National League side. That game uh, starts just after... uh, Soon after the Cleveland Detroit game gets underway, five o'clock, just after five o'clock Eastern first pitch, Yankees Royals tied one one series now at Kauffman Stadium in Kansas City, and then finally the Dodgers and the Padres. San Diego holds on last night with a six five win. They lead the series two one. Tanner will go rapid fire, go game by game, right in order, and then we'll uh, we'll get out of here. But uh, it's a fun time of year. All these series have been excellent. Guardians Tigers. Game one, or pardon me, game three, not game one. Game three, game one of the day. What's the play? It's basically a game one. I mean, series is tied. You know, it's a new series now. Excited to be on this little two-man podcast. And uh, I love to chit-chat about baseball and go too long. So it's cool to be the only analyst on here for today. And for game one, Tigers, Guardians, I like the under. And I'll tell you why. American League Cy Young winner and winner of my favorite pitcher of the year, Tariq Skubal, walked into Progressive Field on, I think it was Monday, tossed seven shutout frames, allowed only three hits, struck out eight, generated 15 swinging strikes, 10 ground balls, zero barrels, blew by batters with high fastballs, forced dumb swings with low changeups, and it was your typical performance from the best pitcher in baseball. But of greater importance, Skubal's seven frames helped reset Detroit's bullpen. Tigers only had to use Will Vess and Bo Brisky for a dozen pitches each. Obviously, the chaos game plan that they've been doing, the um, throw a million bullpen arms, that didn't work well in game one of this series. But the Tigers worked through like seven different relievers in game two of the wildcard series against Houston. So like Tyler Holton, who started that game one, he threw on back-to-back days in Houston and then made the start in Cleveland on two days rest. Like, of course, he got shelled. And now guys like like Holton, uh, Gunther, Hanafi, Job, Herter, those guys are all going to be available and better rested thanks to Scooble's heroics on Monday. And that shouldn't be overlooked because those five, plus the two pitched in game two of this um, divisional series, make up like seven of Detroit's eight highest leverage relievers from a bullpen that basically led the league in every relief metric during the second half of the season. The Tigers are going to throw a million arms at the Guardians, and they're going to be able to throw their better relievers now fully rested after basically letting Reese Olsen pick up the pieces in game one after Holton blew up. So, and look, like like the Guardians, by the way, they looked great in game one. It was a historic performance from what I remember, but they also scored seven runs on eight hits with a 180 expected batting average and a 35% hard hit rate. Half their balls were ground balls, but over a third went for hits. And they dominated with runners in scoring position. Like, let's not let one big game shape how we're looking at the Guardians lineup. And the way I'm looking at it is that that unit slumped through the second half of the season, posting a 93 WRC plus since the All-Star break, 23rd in baseball. They still benefit a bunch from the brand new progressive field wind tunnel. The park factors at progressive are insane and help boost their contact-based lineup. But then again, you you take them away from progressive. They posted a 79 WRC plus away from home in the second half. That's 27th in baseball. And it's also worth mentioning, the Guardians for the entire season were almost 20% worse at run production against right-handed pitching than against southpaws. And the Tigers have a bunch of right-handed relievers in that bullpen, and they're just going to stack righties for nine innings for multi-inning performances, right? Hanafi, Montero, Brisky, Vess, Foley. And I think that's going to work. Work And like now you put the Guardians away from aggressive in Comerica, which has the sixth lowest park factor in baseball. The weather is actually relatively good for hitting on Wednesday, but Comerica is a pitcher's park, downright, especially for afternoon and day games. Since the end of the COVID-shortened year, Comerica games that start before 5 p.m. Eastern time are 94 and 64 to the under. It's plus 23 units, 14% ROI. That includes 24 and 15 this year. Uh, We also get umpire Jim Wolf. He's behind the plate, who has actually historically been an over umpire, but games he's officiated are 47 47 and 41 to the under over the past three years, including 10 and 6 to the under this season, and 4 and 2 to the under 
when the total is seven and a half or lower. And so in the other dugout, just really quickly, and that's my main handicap on this game, but I really like Alex Cobb who starts for Cleveland. I think he posted some really solid numbers across his three starts with the guardians this year. Uh, 107 stuff plus mark, 105 location plus mark, a 61% ground ball rate. If his splitter is working, that's his main pitch. He's really tough to handle. And the Tigers were about average against splitters, but they struck out a lot against the pitch. And they're really below average against righties. The Tigers at home against right-handed pitching this season, 87 WRC+. plus. It's 27th in Major League Baseball. The only worry I have about the total in this game is that Cleveland's bullpen is a tad extended right now. I mean, like, Class A tossed 30 pitches while blowing the win in game two. But it's still, it's the best bullpen in baseball. We can only downgrade it so much because they pitched two days ago. And between Cobb, the chaos, two middling lineups, solid pitching conditions at Comerica, and two great defenses, by the way. You can't overlook that these are two top 10 defensive teams. This is an underplay all the way. Zerillo projects the total at 6.4. So I'm looking for under 7 minus 115 or better. Okay, very good. Thanks, Tanner. The uh, Guardians send Cobb to the mound, as you mentioned. Tigers going to a bullpen game. Phillies-Mets uh, starts just after 5 Eastern. 2-1 series lead for New York. They're going to send Jose Quintana to the mound to try and close the deal. It's Rangers Suarez for Philadelphia, who, as we recall, uh, Suarez, what a great start to the season for him. He was kind of catching everyone, uh, everyone's attention and why the Phillies were going to be a factor in the end, but here they are facing elimination. The Mets are a short favorite total seven and a half. What's the play here? Similar to Scooble for the Tigers. Uh, Shamanaya remained white hot by tossing seven frames of one, one run, one run ball yesterday. And as the Mets built a sizable lead, they got to rest all their highest re- leverage relievers turning to Ryan Stanek and Phil Matone for two innings. So Diaz, Budo, Garrett, Peterson, Ottavino, all haven't pitched in at least three days. Meanwhile, Aaron Nola on Tuesday loaded the bases with no outs in the sixth. So he got through five innings. And then the Phillies had to rely on Kirkering, Alvarado, Ruiz, and Estevez to chew up three or four innings of work. The four combined to throw 60 pitches. Hoffman and Strom were able to rest. But of somewhat more, somewhat more importantly, Orion Kirkering threw in games one, two, and three of this series. And now with the Phillies with their back against the wall, he projects to throw again in game four. And the, yeah, the Phillies there look Suarez, you talked about Suarez, amazing start to the year. Yes. Totally blew up in the second half. I mean, he, he got hurt. I think it was like a lower back strain thing, lost a ton of velocity on his fastball and just couldn't do anything in the second half. And so what I see happening is, The Phillies are going to have a very short, very quick hook on Suarez. It's a do or die kitchen sink game. And by the way, Southpaw Suarez, he's a little vulnerable to platoon splits on top of being not that good, you know, like against a righty heavy Mets lineup that performs about 15% better against left-handed pitching. They were a top five lineup against the side in the regular season by WRC plus with a 118 mark. So I, I can't say I have any more faith in Jose Quintana. Um, I, I just, I don't like the guy that much, but he did. He looked good against the Brewers in the wildcard round. Um, he tossed seven shutout frames the last time he faced the Phillies, although he was slightly worse in his other two tries against the squad. And he's able to overperform this year because the Mets defense behind him is super undervalued by the advanced metrics. They have an awesome defense from Alvarez at catcher to Lindor at short to Nimmo in the outfield. And the Phillies, by the way, conversely to the Mets, the Phillies are very lefty heavy. They still hit well against Southpaws overall, but they project to have four lefties in their lineup, including Schwarber and Harper, two of their best hitters. And after Quintana comes out, the Mets can turn to another lefty in David Peterson for a multi-inning relief effort to attempt to further neutralize those hitters. So if I'm putting all the pieces together in this game, uh, it looks like a bullpen heavy approach for both squads, but the Mets have a far more rested relief unit. They've been the better bullpen in the series and in the second half of the season, the Mets posted top five marks during September in reliever FIP, expected FIP, strikeout rate, war. The Phillies were closer to league average in most bullpen metrics. And I wouldn't give the Phillies a hitting or a defensive advantage in this game. And while it matters so little in this type of game script, 
I can't like power rate Suarez over Quintana right now. And so ironically in a do or die game for the Phils, I really like the Mets here. I'd probably bet them at minus 110 or better, honestly. I think this game sets up really well for them to advance tonight to the NLCS, especially because they have home field. And I will mention though, like I know Zerillo and a lot of guys are on the under here at Action. City Field is a notorious pitcher's park. It's going to be fairly chilly in Queens, maybe 60 degrees. I could see a minus 12, minus 15% adjustment in the run scoring environment. Umpire James Hoy, historically an under umpire, 240 and 201 to the under since 2010. It's about a 5.5% ROI. Bullpen heavy kitchen sink approaches. I would take a good long look at the under here, but I think it, it just got out of range for me. I, I would need probably under seven and a half minus 105, but really like the Mets. Love the Mets here. All right. Mets trying to close the deal. Uh, and move on to the NLCS and just taking a quick peek. I just had a quick look here at the um, the outs props for both of these starting pitchers. Um, are any of those in range at all for you? Um, if Suarez was above 12 outs, if it was yeah, 12 Suarez and a half, is 12 and a half. Yep. That's, that's worth a look. I would definitely play that. Cause I, it, first of all, he's, he's not pitching well. And second of all, if he gets into any trouble at all against, like we talked about the righty heavy yeah. Mets lineup, he's gone. Rob Thompson's going to pull him. I would be very surprised if he makes it into the fourth or fifth inning. Interesting. Okay. All right. Yep. 12 and a half over uh, under is one, minus one Oh two for Ranger Suarez trying to save the season for the Phillies. Okay. Yankees Royals starts just after seven Eastern uh, Clark Schmidt is going to try and save the year for the New York Yankees. Um, again, it's tied 1-1, so not quite save. But then again, these Royals, we've talked about it all year, Tanner. We're in the postseason, but regular season at home, just a very different baseball team when the Royals are at home. Seth Lugo takes the ball for them. Um, the Yankees are short favorites. Oh, what do you uh, what do you make? of It totals eight. I think a bunch of guys in action have already taken under eight or par- over or over eight. I can't remember which one it was. Over eight. Over, over eight. eight. Mm-hmm. That's right, because uh, our our former colleague Anthony DeBundo is now calling Kauffman Stadium Cor- Coors Light. Coors Light, Coors that, Light. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Good. It's fantastic. Go ahead. What do you think on this game? So I also bet the over, but I first I like the Yankees. I really like the Yankees, and the big part about this handicap for me is something I talked about in our divisional series preview, which is that I'm super high on Clark Schmidt. I. I think making him the number three starter over Heal or Stroman is a great move in this game three. He had a big breakout year this year. He started throwing the the patented Brox Bomber cutter. The Yankees teach guys how to use cutters, and they just dominate with them. He posted a 32% whiff rate and a 34% chase rate on the pitch this year. And then you, you combine that with monster stuff plus marks on his two other secondary pitches, the slider and the knuckle curve. He ended up posting a career-high 26% strikeout rate and a career-high 116 stuff plus mark. He, I thought he looked really good in the beginning of the year. I was sad when he got hurt, but I'm, I'm really high on this guy. And meanwhile, I'm, just, I'm still fairly low on Seth Lugo. I, I just think he's overvalued. I mean, he might finish third in American League Cy Young voting. He's not a top three pitcher in the American League. He might not be a top 10 pitcher in the American League. He made some really impressive adjustments late in the season, um, leaning into his cutter and curveball in favor of his four four seam and sinker in September. And his big coming out party for the strategy was actually against the Yankees on September 10th. He obliterated the Yankees in the Bronx, posted seven near perfect innings, three hits, 10 strikeouts, no walks. His cutter curveball mix had a combined 40% called strike plus whiff rate. But for the majority of the season, Lugo posted a low Babbitt, a very, very low home run to fly ball rate, and therefore pretty high expected statistics. He's a good command and control guy with a deep nine pitch mix, but he also just, he doesn't miss many bats. He doesn't produce a lot of weak contact. And outside of that dominant start against the Yankees, the rest of his September consisted of allowing four runs across four innings to the Tigers, a quality start against San Francisco, a two inning outing against Atlanta. And then in the wild card game against the Orioles, um, the O stranded six base runners across four innings. Lugo allowed more fly balls than ground balls. So I'm just, I'm not entirely sure he's the guy 
again after his adjustments or if he's ever really been the guy. And earlier in the year, you know, the Yankees put up four runs on eight hits and a walk across six innings against him at Kaufman. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw that guy again, who I, Mm -hmm. that's more characteristic of who I think Seth Lugo is as a pitcher. And in the other areas of this matchup, not just the starting pitchers, you talked about it. The Royals, awesome lineup at home. But the Yankees are still the best lineup against right-handed pitching in baseball. That's true at home and on the road. They posted a 122 WRC plus against righties on the road. And these two bullpens, both bullpens are fairly extended. I think that's a big key to the total, the over. Two bad bullpens that are fairly extended. But the Yankees have more depth. And their bullpen usage has been more evenly spread out. And starting Schmidt means you could bring in like Heel or Stroman for like a multi-inning relief role. And I would actually prefer that to some of the guys in the back end of that Yankee bullpen or definitely the middle relievers. I mean, for example, like Schmidt posted a 1.5 ERA his first time through the order and a 2.3 his second time through. That number dropped to 8.1 his third time through the order. But Heel posted a 2.2 ERA his first time through the order. So you give those guys three to four innings each and the Yankees are into the seventh inning with no runs on the board. I, I kind of like that game plan. Meanwhile, the Royals have been relying on their top two or three guys. They shifted from using MacArthur Schreiber as their one-two punch to Ursek Bubic, but then they've been kind of riding those two guys hard down the stretch and then into the playoffs. And they are pretty close to having to dip into their lower leverage relievers. And I consider the Royals a bottom five bullpen with minimal depth. And if you're trying to give innings to guys other than Bubic and Ursek, uh, that worries me a lot. All that being said, there is still a chance that Schmidt is not 100%. Uh, he was injured for most of the year, pitched very mad during September, 3.6 ERA, 4.4 expected fit. I'm still low on the Yankees bullpen as a whole. I've always considered them an average to below average unit. Yep. You talked about it. Kaufman is basically Coors Light. Um Rangy outfield gives it a huge extra base hit factor. Umpire Lance Barrett had umpire today is 25 and 16 to the over across the past two seasons. Projections make this total eight and a half to nine. So I'm also going to take a position on the over as a slight hedge to my Clark Schmidt position, because even if he is not as good as I expect him to be, there's still going to be a lot of run production for both sides, considering the two plus lineups and the two minus bullpens and the hitting environment. So, yeah, I, I think the Yankees win this game in a high-scoring barn burner. Okay. Yeah, the lat strain is what uh, was sustained for Schmidt back in um, early, mid-September. Um, outs prop for him is at 13 and a half. Okay. That's tough to say because he's going to be a high-variance guy today because yeah. I, I feel like he's either I, – I, I think he comes out and shoves. Honestly, but if he maybe he comes out, he looks a little sketchy in the first inning. His velocity drops in the second. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just don't I can't get a feel for his status, but I, I like the guy at full health a lot. Yeah, so. just long term, I think what scares the crap out of me. And we're going to get to Dave Roberts in a second is Aaron Boone having to make up his mind with uh, this bullpen, which is shaky right now. The Yankees bullpen. And that's been the yeah. case, not just right now in October, but really for the whole back all year. Yeah, all year. yeah. Okay, uh, and speaking of which, uh, the Dodgers, led by Dave Roberts, they're going to go with a bullpen game tonight uh, to try and keep their season alive. They're at Petco Park. What an atmosphere. Last night, I did stay up late to watch that game, so I'm a little tired this morning. So, so good. Uh, excellent stuff. Padres, a lot of folks in action are on the Padres to win the pennant, to win the World Series. They go up 2-1. They just hang on. Those first few innings were tremendous, tremendous theater. Uh, 6-5 final. So now it's uh, Dylan Cease on three days rest, getting the ball for San Diego to look to close the series. Dodgers, as I mentioned, are going to use a bullpen game. I think they're going to use uh, Knack will kind of be the guy to start, right, as far as getting them a couple innings. Um, Padres are favorites. Totals at seven. What do you think? I believe the Padres last night became the first team um, in baseball history to give up a grand slam and also not score a run after the second inning and still win a game. 
Um, <laughs> it's just, it's how about them Padres? They they're the best bullpen in baseball, best lineup in the playoffs right now, best defense in the playoffs. They're the best team overall in this field. I'm all in. I I have so much money wrapped up in their futures. I feel so good about it. I'm all in. For this all important game four, it's a pretty tough handicap though. Now, Zerillo projects a lot of value on under eight. And I I like the Padres, and I know a lot of people from action like the Padres, you know, from like a baseball game perspective, you know, sort of like if I had to pick a guy to a team to win this game, I would pick the Padres. But I'm not gonna bet them at minus one fifty when the Dodgers are going to throw everything they have and Cease is starting on short rest. Um, Cease, by the way, is starting so that you Darvish can be available for a potential game five. So I do think this is the smart move, but it's tough to say how he's going to perform. So here's where things get fuzzy for me. I don't know who's going to start for the Dodgers. I think it could be Ryan Brazier. I, could, I think it could be someone else, but I think that Landon Knack is going to be sort of the bulk guy The you know, might try and eat up three or four innings. He is a rookie who pitched 69 innings this season, and he figures to be a huge part of LA's game plan on the mound in a do or die elimination game. That is a, that's a huge problem. And it's the same story for the Dodgers year after year where the starting pitching depth just is not there. I mean, uh, Walker Bueller allowed allowed six runs last night. Jack Flaherty looked bad in game two. His velocity is a huge question mark. Yamamoto struggled in game one. And, Although I really like guys like Michael Kopech, Blake Trinan, Evan Phillips, et cetera, I think the Dodgers' bullpen is generally undervalued. I don't mind them going to a bullpen game. I just can't trust Knack in this monster high-leverage game against an absurdly talented, high-floor, pesky, contact-based Padres lineup. This game is high variance, and if Knack blows up, it likely sends LA packing. And Knack has been pretty good this year. I mean, he's probably undervalued as a whole, but we're talking about expected run indicators ranging from 3.8 to 4.7 above average stuff numbers and strikeout numbers, but below average command and control metrics, which really show up in his batted ball profile. Knack allows a ton of quality contact. Now on the Padres side, relievers Suarez, Scott, Adam, and Estrada combined for 54 pitches last night. Um, Tanner Scott has pitched in all three games of this series and may get used again on Wednesday, which is huge given he's the Padres' best reliever. San Diego's bullpen, it's the team's biggest advantage, but I worry that they're just a tad stretched entering this game. I will say, though, um, Cease has pitched on four days of rest 15 times this year, and he's actually been way more effective working on four days of rest than five or six days of rest. He posted a sub three ERA across 15 starts on four days rest. Oh, it's four, not three. Okay. No, no, he's, but, but he has yet to pitch on three days rest in his okay. career. Got it. So Got it. one would think like, oh, shorter rest. Maybe there's something to that. Maybe he performs better, but he's never pitched on three days of rest. That worries me. I don't know what I'm going to get from him. So I personally cannot get there on a side or a total. I think there are too many confounding variables in this game but I have a ton of money tied up in San Diego futures. I'm going to ride them out because I think they're live. I think the Padres are really live to win the whole thing. Okay. I mean, there's not much more to be said. I mean, that dude Suarez last night, holy crap. He's good. Um, Scott was good too. Scott was The Padres have a lot of stuff guys in their bullpen, right? Guys that just come out and throw nasty stuff like Estrada. Oof. It's fun. And Scott, obviously. Scott's been one of the best high leverage relievers in yeah. the game for the past two years. With the Marlins, he was amazing. So, yeah. But just, it, John Smoltz said it on the broadcast last night nothing seemed to have phased Suarez. Yeah. Back on the bump, catch the ball. He's looking at his grip. He's just not, you just couldn't tell um, in, a big, in. In, a, in a big spot like that. So, all right, Tanner, we'll see. We'll see. Padres try to close the deal tonight. Uh, in game four at home. Um, so there we go. Tanner McGrath, find his fine work over at the Action Network. He's getting ready for college basketball season right now as well. So check him out there, Action Network app, actionnetwork.com. We are back tomorrow because there's more baseball. Um, so join us then. There's a Whenever there's a game, we have payoff pitch on weekdays. So whenever there's a game during the week, we will join you. So come uh, come back to us for we will have game fours between the Guardians and Tigers and the Yankees and Royals to get you ready for tomorrow.
For Tanner McGrath, Brendan Glasheen, thanks for tuning in. Payoff Pitches Action Network's MLB betting podcast. You all enjoy your Wednesday. Enjoy the baseball. 